Hello, everyone. Welcome to the panel discussion on Jansen Connell's 50th anniversary. Where are we? My name is Liza Kamita. I'm a professor of tropical ecology in the School of the Environment at Yale University and a research associate at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute. And co-moderating this panel with me today is Rodolfo Dirso. Good morning, everybody. Delighted to be with you. My name is Rodolfo Dirso. Greetings from the Mo land of the Mowegma Olone because I want to recognize the indigenous peoples of, this, of the places where we do our research around the planet. I'm delighted, a professor in biology in Stanford University, and I'm a fan of my co-moderator and the three fantastic speakers of the panel. Thank you. So let us get started. The exuberant physiognomy of tropical forests is largely imparted by the astonishing diversity of the predominant life form, the trees. Numerous ideas and hypotheses have been proposed to examine and explain what maintains such tree diversity. However, no hypothesis has been as influential, stimulating and productive as the now commonly known jansen connell hypothesis or JCH. Indeed, 50 years after the publication of the landmark papers by Dan Jansen and Joe Connell, these ideas are still very much relevant and important for us to reflect on where we are in our understanding of this fundamental question and the role that JCH has played on it. Liza. In this panel, we have three prominent ecologists, Lissy Coley, John Turborg, and Dan Jansen himself will present their perspectives and significance, perspectives on the significance, remaining knowledge gaps, and future avenues in the study of the maintenance of tropical forest diversity in the context of the jansen connell hypothesis. Before we invite our first speaker, I'd like to run you through some general logistics. Please submit any questions that you may have through the Q&A tab. Questions will be read and addressed after the three talks during the Q&A session. In other words, please submit your questions at any time and we will collect them and invite all speakers to answer them at the end of the three presentations. Okay, so uh, we'll go to our first speaker, John Terborg. Throughout his career, John Terborg has enriched the academic life of a number of universities in the US. He has been a professor um, with the University of Maryland, uh, Princeton and Duke, and currently he's a professor emeritus of environmental science in Duke University. At Duke, he founded the university's Center for Tropical Conservation. And John has current affiliations with the University of Florida at Gainesville and the James Cook um, University in Australia. Professor Terber was instrumental in the establishment in 1973 of the Cocha Cashew Biological Station in the amazing Manu National Park in Peru. You might have seen the PBS program, The Serengeti Rules, uh, which shows uh, John Terber as a fantastic young um, naturalist and in some sense ecologist chasing fireflies. And he got interested in forests and he got his PhD on plant physiology from Harvard. His knowledge of plants is complemented by his expertise in zoology. Indeed, he's a fantastic ornithologist and a mammalian ecologist. His work is really legendary and focuses on tropical ecology, particularly on plant animal interactions and trophic cascades. Which, is my, which are my favorite topics. Apart from his plethoric work in Manu, at Manu, I wish to highlight his research in the Lake Guri in Venezuela, where he documented the collapse of ecosystems in small islands, driven by the collapse of the food chain, which usually started with the loss of the top predators, triggering the explosion of herbivores and the subsequent devastation of the plant community. In addition to his prolific work in Peru, he has conducted research in the tropics around the world, including the West Indies, Africa, Malaysia, and New Guinea. And he has published um, hundreds of articles and eight books, some of them um, really fantastic books, my, some of them my favorite books. He is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and uh, he's also a member of the US National Academy of Sciences. He was awarded a Pew Fellowship in 1992 and became a MacArthur Fellow in the same year. 
John has remained, remained active in research and conservation up to now. So John, thank you so much for, for what you have done for tropical biology and for the community. The floor is yours. Thank you, Rodolfo, very generous uh, introduction. I'm grateful for it. Um, and now I think I do a screen share and uh, let's see if we can get this going. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, I'm very happy and to have this opportunity to kick off our celebration of the 50th anniversary of uh, the James Connell hypothesis. And I wanna just, uh, um, we'll put it into perspective by comparing two, two of these theoretical ideas that Rodolfo mentioned, of which there are many, and this is just a, a sampling of, of the, the most extreme models. Uh, and uh, we will see how different they are in their machinery and in the conclusions they leave to. One uh, is the most familiar model in ecology, the Lot de Volterra. Uh, model, uh, which is a quintessentially a bottom-up model, and uh, the other will be Jansen Connell, which is a top-down model. And as we'll see, the predictions that one gets from these two opposite models are in fact opposite. And uh, uh, this is an important point that I, I don't think has been very clearly emphasized in some of the literature. Well, here is the uh, Lotka Volterra model it's uh it, it's based on two differential equations which have four solutions and as you can see solutions a b and c lead to a single winner only the fourth solution d uh, can accommodate two species and if you try to push lotka volterra much beyond two species it it eventually uh, it fails it goes into chaos and it's uninterpretable so um, essentially, a, a competition leads to very low diversity, and this this is something we know from our own everyday experience with with sports. Uh, this is just an example of what competition really is in the real world. Uh, on the left panel, you see uh, the lineup of, of of competitors for the New York Marathon, a huge race that involves thousands of people who all surge forward at the sound of the starting gun and then about two hours and 15 minutes later one person crosses the finish line well where are the rest well they're strung out over the 26 mile course there's only one winner even when you start with 10,000 beginner uh, a starting the crowd so um, this is a model of competition we ought to take more to heart i think in ecology because it really it's it competition works this way and now the Jansen Connell hypothesis does not have competition as a component of it. Instead, it is the product of two, two curves. The one on the left mark I is the seed shadow, it's a familiar to most of you, I'm sure. And then what I call escape curve P on the right. And the probability of that a seed will be successful is the product of those two curves, and that's indicated by the little dash line. This is the figure from Dan's original publication. Something very important here is that the escape curve does not begin at, at the base of the tree. It begins well, uh, well away from the base of the tree, and in our experience, often 30 or 50 meters away from the base of the tree. So. Um, this is the hallmark of the Jansen Cottle model. It's it's recruitment at a distance, and I want to just show you these this one slide of data from our work at Cochacasu in Peru. We uh, in the upper left we monitored a, monitored a plot for uh, trees for saplings down to one meter tall, very quite small saplings and seed fall for more than 10 years. And uh, this is the outcome of that long-term monitoring. The, uh, the, blue sh the, the, the green symbols are the two individuals of this species, uh, Caryodaphnoptis fosteri, named for Robin Foster, um, in, the, in the plot. And uh, uh, the central tree was reproductive. The other green symbol is of a pre-reproductive, juvenile tree. Um, the 
The seed fall into that plot of this species is indicated by the shadings of brown, and you see uh, it uh, forms a concentric pattern, as you would expect from a normal seed shadow curve. And then out in the white zone are red triangles. Well, those are the saplings of this species that recruited into that plot. And uh, you'll see that there's a major disconnect between where saplings are recruiting and where the seeds are falling. Um, uh, the, uh, the differences uh, uh, illustrated in the uh, expected observed uh, plot at the bottom, uh, the ex if all seeds were equal, then you'd expect most of the uh, recruiting saplings to occur immediately around the adult tree. Well, that's not true. It's the polar opposite of that. Uh, expressing the, the avoidance of recruitment uh, of the vicinity of reproductive adult trees. Now, on the right, you can see we've actually been able to quantify the, uh, the seed shadow and ex um, uh, escape curves of the model, just as Dan drew them years and years ago. Um, and on the upper right is the, uh, is the seed shadow, uh, most of which is comprised of undispersed seeds. Um, at 25 meters, you'll see that the seed rain becomes almost undetectable. And yet that is where we begin to see surviving seedlings. It's in a zone where the seed rain is so sparse that we can hardly measure it. But that's where all the recruitment takes place. And you can see the escape curve as just the shape that Jansen um, drew way back in 1970. So that's how the model works. And uh, you can see it with your own eyes when it's presented this way. Now, I want to show some examples um, of Lotka Volterra forest and of Jans Connell forest. So I'm starting with Lotka Volterra forest. Uh, you can see the, um, in the upper left, a, a red spruce forest that's a boreal type. Um, then in the middle of, of an American beech forest, this is the one Henry Horn wrote about in the Princeton Institute Woods. A beech can uh, attain monodominant status in uh, several circumstances in, in forests in eastern North America. On the top right is a Nothophagus forest in New Zealand. In the top left, and the bottom left, D, is uh, thanks uh, to Terry Hankel, you can see a a bit of the Dicimbe corimbosa monodominant forest, which is prevalent in the, in the Guyanan region. And next to it, E, is a similar tropical monodominant forest of Gilbertia dendron duevii in Cameroon, also thanks to Terry Heckel. In both of these, you can see very plainly that there's their seedlings, their pole-sized uh, recruits, that's saplings, and uh, large uh, mature adult trees, and they're all growing in the same places. There is no exclusion uh, that is the uh, critical criterion of the Jansen Connell. So these are not Jansen Connell forests. I think these are just dominated, that they're good luck of Volterra forests. That is they're the outcome. These are the best competitors, and they win. Um, on, the, on the bottom right is sort of a totally different thing. This is a, uh, a moss carpet that has overgrown a glacial outwash plain in, in southwestern Iceland. Um, it's an Arctic counterexample of a type of uh, single species dominance in competition, uh, but it's more like the uh, models of, of uh, Jackson and Buss of, of uh, over, overgrowth of encrusting organisms in a marine environment. So this may be a totally different kind of of competition that leads to monodominance. Uh, something uh, that is clearly a global pattern is that Jansen Connell does not work in quite aquatic or semi-aquatic environments uh, where one sees monodominance routinely as even Paul Richards meant, uh, um, commented on way back uh, in his book in 1952 about Mora forests. Uh, you see on the across the top, black spruce bog in Alaska, a bald cypress swamp in Georgia, USA, and then see a species of mangrove, I don't know what, in, in Indonesia. On the bottom, there is um, a, a 
the beginnings of what I will show in the next slide is zonation. And in the front is a, is a shrubby tree, a Forestaria cuminata in Florida on the Santa Fe River. It grows in, in running water, whereas the bald cypress is behind it and it grows in still water. So that's a, a gradient that separates them. Uh, e, e is my uh, wife in a kayak in Cochacasio in Peru in a year when the lake uh, exploded in submerged aquatic vegetation, we call it SAV. And again, that's monodominant as you can see uh, when you look through the water in the, in the F. Now, um, if, if the lockable Terra model is, is, is allowed to vary with the alphas or the K, the carrying capacity, it, it predicts that on environmental gradients, there will be abrupt uh, transitions between competitive dominance. And um, that's been called zonation in the literature for a long time. Here you see it in A on a, on a oxbow lake in Peru. There's a heliconia in the background and a polygonum zone and in the front scirpus zone. In uh, B is a uh, freshwater marsh in Florida, uh, where you see several zones. C is in Gabon, a freshwater marsh in Gabon, Africa, with a sedge in the background and a Ludwigia in the foreground. Uh, another uh, lake in Peru in D uh, with scirpus, um, limnobium frogs bit as a zone of that, and then uh, uh, Ludwigia helminthe rise a floating one on the, the nearest part of that figure. And on the right, something that will be familiar with most of you, a, a, a zoned marsh of Spartina alterniflora and Juncus romerianus. You can see this anywhere on the east coast of the United States. Now, all those contrast enormously with this, which is what we really are talking about in the uh, relation to Jansen Connell. Uh, this cross section exposes some features of the forest that aren't much talked about in terms of Jansen Connell, but nevertheless very important. Um, the, going back to Paul Richards again in, in 1952, he put out the first book on tropical forests in which he developed the thesis that the forests were vertically structured with emergence at the top up, whoops, sorry, this is unstable, uh, with great broad crowns, then a, uh, then a main canopy uh, at this level where the crowns are smaller and closely packed, then a third sea level under in the mid-story. And you'll notice that these mid-story trees, and there's a whole collection of them there, uh, all have crowns that are much deeper than than broad, whereas on the top of the canopy, they're much broader than they are deep. And then there are two, two more zones beyond the uh, C zone. There's a D zone with treelets, small trees, and then uh, an E zone, mostly herbaceous plants. Well, the, here is a lot of niche differentiation in a forest that is uh, obeying all the expectations of the jansen connell model. So there is more than jansen connell going on in tropical forests. There is a lot more. I'm just scratching the surface because I don't have more time to talk about it. So in conclusion, Lacta Volterra is a niche model based on competition for limiting resources. Weak competitors are excluded, resulting in low diversity and abrupt species replacement on environmental gradients. Jansen Connell is based on the action of host specific mortality agents that create the exclusion zones around the a perimeter of reproducing adults. It predicts recruitment at a distance, mixed communities, low dominance, and high diversity. So if we look at the wider world, we can see that a lot of familiar communities conform to the Lacca Volterra model. And uh, you can read the list, tropical temperate and boreal monodominant forests and, and conifer forests and, and all these aquatic environments I've talked about. On the right, there are an increasing number of communities that are being proposed to conform the Jans Cottle model, including a number of temperate forests, and the references are there. And there's even a report that Jans Connell operates in some grasslands, a report from Eastern Europe. I uh, find myself very surprised by that, but I, I, I wouldn't rule it out. And then uh, evidence that Jansen Connell operates also in coral reefs. So um, I'll leave you with this. This is a uh, 
a temperate forest, a very lovely one in Virginia, and uh, this too may be a Janssen Connell forest. So um, I'm very happy to have had this occasion to tell you these things, and uh, um, I'll pass it on to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you so very much, John, for this wonderful presentation combining theory and fantastic natural history. And also thank you for making reference to the great Paul Richards. That's really wonderful. And um, Liza, please, back to you. It's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Um, our second speaker is Dr. Lissy Coley. Lissy is a distinguished professor at the University of Utah, a research associate at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in Panama, and a fellow of the Ecological Society of America and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Her career is focused on plant herbivore interactions in forests throughout the tropics. Her early research examined patterns of anti-herbivore defenses and how investments in defense are linked to plant species life histories and resource availability with a number of classic papers that I find myself going back to frequently. Uh, much of her work has focused on chemical defenses in, in the tropical tree genus Inga and Fabaceae, using that speciose and widespread genus as a model system to really understand how herbivores may be driving rapid evolution of defenses and how this might contribute to community assembly and speciation as well as the maintenance of diversity. Um, her work has undoubtedly made foundational contributions to our understanding of tropical forest ecology, um, particularly around herbivore, plant herbivore interactions and chemical defenses. In addition, her research on chemical defenses has led to a multi-million dollar bioprospecting program that she established in Panama, which has had a major impact on both science and conservation as well as capacity development um, within Panama. So it's my pleasure to turn the floor over to Lissy for her talk. Thank you, Liza, that was really nice. Um, so um, for several centuries, naturalists, and including myself, um, have been intrigued by um, how the tropics can harbor so many species. In other words, how can 650 different tree species cram into a single hectare of tropical forest? What allows them to coexist without a few winners um, becoming dominant? And as you know, two extremely influential papers by Jansen and Connell propose that it's um, due to pests. Um, to, to address these questions of coexistence and speciation, uh, we chose to focus on um, Inga, which is a rainforest tree in the pea family. And the reason we chose it is because it's extremely speciose with more than 300 species in the Neotropics. And it seems to have explosively radiated very recently. Um, it's also one of the most diverse genera at any given site, as well as the most abundant in terms of stems. So if we can explain how so many closely related Inga can coexist, that should be helpful for understanding uh, what factors promote local diversity more generally. So um, Dale's data from Inga in Panama show a significant um, negative effect of being near a conspecific for both survival and growth. And many studies um, have demonstrated negative density dependence, and it's widely considered to be why rainforests are so diverse. No one species can dominate because it does worse near a conspecific, as John so beautifully showed. Um, but why do we see negative density dependence? And there are two leading hypotheses. Um, it could be that competition for resources is higher among conspecifics than among unrelated species, or the conspecifics share pests. And Dale's data are the first to simultaneously test these uh, leading two hypotheses. And he tested the first hypothesis and found no effect on survival for common traits related to resource acquisition. Um, patterns are similar for growth. And this suggests then that competition for resources is probably not a key driver of negative density dependence. What about pests? Well, Dale's data show that both growth and survival are lower if neighbors have similar herbivore communities. So there's a much stronger negative effect of neighbor similarity for herbivores uh, compared to competition. But what determines the herbivore host choice that must underlie this effect? Well, it's not host phylogeny, but host defense traits. And Inga has evolved a battery of defenses um, chemicals, trichomes, developmental traits such as the speed of leaf expansion, extrafloral nectaries to attract ants, 
and to phenological traits. And all of these defenses um, contribute significantly to explaining host choice in herbivores. But the most important is secondary metabolites, and these comprise an impressive 50% of the dry weight of expanding leaves, with each leaf containing um, approximately 200 compounds. And all six classes, um, all of these defenses, they're orthogonal, which means they're evolving um, independently, leading to an infinite number of defense combinations. So if we look at the effect size on survival of sharing these defense traits with neighbors, we see a significant effect of chemistry and we find the same pattern for growth. So having similar defenses as one neighbor is bad. Only species that are different in defenses can grow near each other, enforcing a high species diversity. But why is sharing defenses bad? Do herbivores care about all these defenses? In other words, what determines um, host choice? And apparently herbivores do care as most species only feed on a limited number of hosts. And here's some data from one site in Peru. And we collected thousands of caterpillars belonging to 175 herbivore species as determined by barcoding. And approximately um, 140 of them were only found feeding on one to three different species of Inga. Um, 20 species um, could feed on up to six Inga and a few were able to feed on up to nine. But remember, it's a jungle out there um, and there are well over 500 species of plants in the neighborhood, yet any given herbivore can only feed on a very small fraction. So there's this high degree of specialization. And we think the defenses we measured may drive this specialization. Remember, there were six independent defense axes and it turns out that different families care about different defenses. So Gallicaeids uh, cared most about chemistry but also phylogeny in part because they care about hairs, which is the only defense with a phylogenetic signal. And they also prefer leaves that expand slowly. Um, Riodinids care about chemistry, but um, also they choose plants with ants and uh, generally ants are predatory and not a good thing, but Riodinids have a mutualism with ants and actually prefer plant species with more ants. And Arabidae care about chemistry and the timing of leaf production. So different families appear to have specialized adaptations to different defense traits. So in Inga, there's no evidence that competition for resources affects negative density dependence and therefore coexistence. Instead, if a plant has divergent defenses from its neighbors, it does not share herbivores and has better growth and survival. So this is very strong evidence for the Jansen-Connell effect. However, our study and other studies showing negative density dependence have focused on neighboring plants on the scale of meters. What about the scale of the whole forest? Is it adaptive to be divergent from other species in the community? In other words, could the Jansen-Connell effect operate over the scale of kilometers? And so to test this, we looked at Inga across much of its range at five sites in the Neotropics, uh, Panama, Peru, Brazil, French Guiana, and Ecuador. And we asked if the community of Inga species at each site shows evidence of defense divergence. In other words, could herbivores uh, and defenses be shaping community assembly at this larger scale? Uh, apparently, yes. Um, here, each dot is a species color-coded by site and the PCA separates them based on their chemical similarity. And the circles are the 95% confidence interval for each site and they're completely overlapping. So at each site, the species of Inga present are different, but the assembly at each site spans the entire chemical space. Thus, Marie Jose showed that the ability to coexist in a forest appears to depend on having defenses that are as different from the rest of the community um, as possible. And if we look at the explanatory power of defense chemistry, it counts for over 60% of the community composition at each of the five sites. Uh, in contrast, uh, Inga phylogeny uh, accounts for less than 20%. But, but what is phylogeny uh, a proxy for? Well, remember there was no phylogenetic signal for secondary metabolites. So phylogeny is independent from defenses. Other studies have showed uh, a phylogenetic signal for leaf economic traits that are associated with resource acquisition and abiotic stress tolerance. But the Inga present at a site do not appear to be selected based on traits associated 
with phylogeny. So defenses seem to be the key um, structuring community assembly. So our data strongly support the Janssen Connell hypothesis, demonstrating that it's adaptive to have divergent defenses from one's neighbor at the local scale of meters so as not to share herbivores. We also showed, and I think for the first time, that it's adaptive to be different from other species in the broader community at the larger scale of kilometers. So I just wanna take a minute to suggest that if we expand from the ecological to the evolutionary scale, we can ask if it's adaptive to be divergent from one's close relatives. And here are data from Panama and Peru with the Inga phylogeny on the left and the chemical similarity dendrogram on the right. And there's no phylogenetic signal. Um, more closely related species are not more similar in defenses. And just to drive this point home, um, this clade of close relatives makes compounds that span the entire chemical space. And the species that make saponins in the lower right box um, are clustered in the chemical dendrogram, but are spread throughout the phylogenetic tree. So there appears to be very rapid evolution of defenses. Um, could this rapid evolution promote speciation? You know, in other words, could it explain why there are so many species of Inga? Um, perhaps. And our working hypothesis is that for populations with limited gene flow, traits that are most divergent would favor barriers to reproduction should the populations come in to contact again. And herbivores create a moving target for defense adaptations, a red queen scenario, in a way that the abiotic environment does not. Uh, thus, anti-herbivore defenses could be diverging more rapidly than adaptations to the abiotic environment, thereby promoting speciation. So to return to my original question, plant herbivore interactions seem fundamental for explaining tree coexistence uh, in the tropics on the scale of meters as predicted by Jansen and Connell. And that plant herbivore interactions also seem to shape the assembly of communities across kilometers. And finally, they may help us explain why are there so many species in the first place? Thank you. Thanks, Lizzie, for a great talk. Um, we already have lots of questions rolling in. Just to remind you in the audience, you're welcome to, to enter your questions in at any time in the Q&A box, and we'll be taking questions at the end of our last talk. Um, and Rudolfo will be introducing our next speaker. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation, Lizzie, and thank you, Liza. Let me now move on to introduce our next speaker, Professor Dan Jansen, Daniel Jansen. Dan Jansen got his PhD from this amazing university close to where I am now at UC Berkeley. And Dan has been a professor at the University of Kansas, Chicago and Michigan. And since 1976, he has been a professor at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. Dan is also a technical advisor to the Guanacaste Conservation Area or the Area de Conservación Guanacaste, AECG. Um, a, um, this area, in case you don't know, is a huge conservation area in northwestern Costa Rica in the Guanacaste province. Um, it's about 170,000 hectares um, conservation area. So Dan is a tropical ecologist with 66 years of field experience. And he has published hundreds of scientific papers and books. <clears throat> Excuse me, some of you <clears throat> will remember the amazing book, The Costa Rica Natural History, one of my favorite books in tropical biology. Many of Dan's studies examine the interactions between animals and plants, including obviously herbivory, pollination, dispersal, seed predation. And several of his publications are recognized as classics in the literature, starting with his papers on the coevolution between acacias, acacia trees, and the ant acacias that he studied for his PhD and those uh, papers were, have been followed by a plethora of um, watershed studies, <clears throat> including one of my favorites, neotropical plant anachronisms, as well as the paper that is the motivation for our panel discussion today. The herbivores and the number of three species in tropical forests published in American Naturalist in 1970. Dan has received numerous awards so many that it would take me a long time to list them here, but I just wish to mention that he is a member 
of the US National Academy of Sciences. And he is also a member of the Costa Rica National Academy of Sciences. Dan Jensen and Winnie Holwox, his wife, are the co-designers and co-constructors, along with many other collaborators uh, of several outstanding projects in Costa Rica and places of significance at the global level, including what I mentioned before, the ACG, the um, Guanacaste Conservation Area, and the INVIO, the National Institute of Biodiversity in Costa Rica. And um, another gigantic project that Dan and Jansen, uh, Dan and, and Winnie have been um, um, developing and are currently engaged in is the facilitation of the international uh, barcode of life efforts to basically DNA barcode all species of the, of the world. So it's truly wonderful to have Dan Jansen in this panel dedicated to reflecting on the jansen Connolly hypothesis 50 years after its publication. But I want to take one nanosecond to also mention Joe Connell, who was the other person who on the same year actually published a very significant uh, paper looking at the same kinds of issues in both terrestrial and, and aquatic and marine systems. And so this is a tremendous honor for us to be hosting this panel where we celebrate and reflect on the jansen Connell hypothesis. So without further ado, Thank you so much, Dan, for what so much for so much that you have done for tropical biology and for illuminating our understanding of this wonderful ecosystem of the planet. Floor is yours, Dan. <clears throat> well, thank you very much, Rodolfo, for that very um, eloquent introduction. Uh, probably which we don't deserve, but um, anyway, we 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 do what we can. Um, I would like to. Uh, pull up a screen share thing uh, to work from uh, for all of you. So let me just take a second to do that and um, get it there. All right. Now, Rodolfo asked us to discuss about the Janzokana hypothesis to understand tropical biodiversity, but to also help us reflect and act on the urgency of its conservation, given the challenges of the Anthropocene. Now, for me to address that challenge, I need to start at the very beginning. The Jansen hypothesis came about in 1965, standing by a small airstrip in the rainforest on the Osa Peninsula in Costa Rica. And the plane was late. The rainforest intact was about 20 meters from the airstrip. I walked into the forest, and at that time I was studying seed predation by animals, and found myself standing in a large seed shadow of a large tree called Aspidosperma. And I decided to pick up a lot of these wind dispersed seeds to see if there was some animal eating them inside, an insect in eating them. And I picked up perhaps 50 or 100 of them from underneath the tree, and they were all attacked by a crambid moth larva. So I started in frustration walking out from the tree to find intact ones, and I went. 10 meters, 20 meters, and finally I got out to where I could just barely find a very few fruits and they were intact. Now this took place because I happened to be standing next to an airstrip next to a primary 50 meter tall tropical rainforest. That rainforest today is all rice field. It's all gone. Second, the paper derived from really a description of that direct observation. And I'd like to start this introduction by simply saying all of the papers that have been useful to people about the tropics in these last 50 plus years have been based on a direct observation, not a hypothesis. Other people have taken them as hypotheses 
and built on them as hypotheses and tested them as hypotheses. But what I want to emphasize is what's being forgotten is the importance of the first observation in the first place, actually seeing this happen in nature and then thinking about it rather than starting in a classroom on a screen or on a blackboard. Now, This has been observed by many people in the past. There was a guy named Luis Agassi, who is now very much out of cultural favor um, in the 1800s, who study, he said, study nature, not books. Well, I would say today, study nature and the smartphones come afterwards, not beforehand. Learn the wilderness, stand in it, smell it, feel it, understand it, and then Start worrying about how and what to do with it and about it, all right? That viewpoint gave me as a young man after Korea and before Vietnam, after my stint in the army, the freedom from the village rules, the village bureaucracy of academia to produce most of the things that people have been interested in or, or praise uh, about my career. So Rodolfo asked, where are we? The first thing is why am I talking from a printed page rather than showing you photographs? Because I have in the last 20 years or 30 years spent a lot of time listening to people in their native languages, which I could manage a little bit and not really being able to understand them. So I've decided that for today's world, of the very large number of people whose mothers did not speak English in the tropics are trying to listen to this talk. Now, I also want to emphasize, because we're always asked, where are we now? To me, we are now where we are in, yeah, sure, technical space. That's what we're talking about traditionally in our academic ivory towers. But we are now today in interaction space, the interaction with the rest of the world. That's where the real challenges lie. Okay. Now this got started for us in 1985, 20 years after that paper that you are focused on. 20 full years, that's almost a whole career in the military world, that is a career afterwards when we were asked by the Costa Rican government to take a look at the impact of 1,500 gold miners in that same national park, which is pretty much now all destroyed on its margins. And what we found by talking to the gold miners was that they were perfectly good, honorable, middle-class Costa Rican citizens who viewed the forest as up for grabs because it wasn't being used by anybody for anything in their world, in their vision, and had no owner in their world and their vision. So that caused us to suddenly realize we have to put one foot outside of our academic world into the street and address the people who will make a difference as to whether that forest actually survives in the long run. All our studies will not do that. But if the societies around those wild areas do feel that this is a useful part of their worlds, they will want to keep it, like they keep hospitals, highways, internet, iPhones, and all the rest. Now, that really gelled for me 30 years after that, after the first paper itself. Standing in front of a very high level, very well healed audience in the UN, explaining all these marvels that we do technically about the rainforest. And I suddenly realized that directly, if we don't step out of that world, we'll turn around 20, 30, 50 years from now or today, and that forest won't be there anymore for anyone to study period, be gone. The place I did my thesis research in Veracruz, Mexico, 
a gorgeous tropical ecosystem that had survived 5,000 years of lowland Indian Mexican use is today an enormous sugarcane plantation without a trace of all the forest that I studied. It's gone. Now, today, Winnie and I are 82 and 66 years old. You all, the audience for this talk, not the panelists, are in the same position psychologically, socially, that we were at that time, where we were in 1965, where we were in 1985. You are 20 years old, 30 years old, 40 years old. So the question becomes the challenge where are we today? You're that. And what is, where do you put all your energy? So we made the choice in 1985 to step out part way. We did not abandon the university. It is a very comfortable, very useful, and very encouraging and rewarding platform. But it is incompatible in a full total sense with the street. Now, all of this concern for me has sort of shrunk down into a very simple-minded statement. When the house is on fire, I don't need a thermometer. I don't need to know, is it burning hotter in the kitchen than in the living room than in the basement? I don't need to know whether the fire has been going for three hours or five hours. I don't need to know which kind of chemical might put it out somewhere. I need a fire department. I need fire codes. I need hospitals. I need people to report what's going on so that the other houses next door don't burn down. Right? Those are the things that we need. Now, our efforts since then have been heavily, heavily integrated with a very diverse array of international and national collaborators in Costa Rica. That's our laboratory, if you like. But we're invited guests. We're standing in someone's living room suggesting where to put the furniture. So this requires a totally different way of thinking about the world and the people you're talking to than does the strictures and bureaucracies of our universities for our various degrees and stages of development. Now, you can do tropical taxonomy and ecology solely for your academic payday. That's the trajectory all of you are on or very close to being on. Or you can design them so that they do that and they favor the bugs and the trees at the same time in the eyes of the social community who actually owns them. We do not, no matter how much logical or truth we convey and write our papers about, we do not own them. So what it turns down to is, we find ourselves asking questions about the same forest that you study as to how do you find the things who are there? How do you understand the things that are there? You have, in our case, it's DNA marketing them all for recognition by everybody and promoting that technical process along with its necessary cultural and political hangers on and components. We found ourselves in a Costa Rican situation where the government finally, after 30 some years of um, nudging and um, being around these ideas is now finding it allowable for the process that produced the Arde Conservación Guanacaste uh, to begin to spread out over the whole country. And one component of that is approving at the political social level, the concept of DNA barcoding the entire country, which is to generate a, a library against which technology can allow anybody anywhere to know what it is that they're dealing with. Okay. So remember, the biodiversity you study 
those caterpillars on Lissy's ingas, John's herbivores in that lake in Venezuela are biomonitors, they're biodegraders, they're bioprospecting tools, they bioeducate, they're good for biotourists, they bioirrigate, they biocreate, and they biorepair. All those tools and abilities are right there, mostly latent, mostly not appreciated or developed or, or expected by society. And remember, all of that out there is what evolutionarily produced us. We didn't come from some other planet. There's a little hooker in this. There's a temptation to think about restoring wild areas, especially damaged ones, to the original in the tropics. Forget about it. We, since the Pleistocene, have been altering the whole system so much that the original will never be seen by any of us. And now with climate change layered on top of all that, we have even less chance. So the best we can do is provide them with a free open platform into which be themselves wild, compete with each other, do their thing, but it'll never be the original. All right? So we can't ever go back to the original and it's a waste of time to even try. So from our standpoint, what is the situation today, 50 years later? The entire house is on fire. Okay. Now, just as a last couple of notes, this is the Association for Tropical Biology and Conservation. Notice the word academic does not appear in that phrase. Yet, when I get the URL to tune into this panel discussion, I read what you see there in green. This link should not be shared with others. It is unique to you, password such and such. Now, why doesn't the ATBC have there a link that says, for the general public, anybody who wants to listen to any of this is very welcome. Here is the link. I'm standing here in front of you or talking to you because of a Minneapolis public library when I was a young teenager was full open stacks. And I spent years in those open stacks studying the natural history of humans written down on all the books of any kind available for me to read. I shot my first pheasant off the back steps of our house in the suburbs of Minneapolis but I caught the bus to the Minneapolis Public Library on the front door and had wilderness out of the back door. That world is not available to most of the people who are listening to this today. Thank you very much. Happy for any questions. Thank you so much, Dan, for this um, profound and thought-provoking presentation as always. Um, we're going to open it for questions, but but um, while you were going through your transcript, uh, there were a number of uh, fantastic topics that you did not have time on touching. And before we go to the questions, I wanted to see that in connection with your last comment, you want to say something about the bio alpha, because I think it's very relevant to the idea of sharing and communicating broadly. Can you take a nanosecond to address that and then we'll go to the more general questions then, please. Thank you, Rodolfo. I was trying very much to uh, match the um, yeah. time limit. <laughs> so very quickly, bio-alpha is a condensation or a contraction of the word bioalphabetization, which in Spanish is the same as bioliteracy in English. And bioliteracy means being able to literally read the forest. Today, you drop me by parachute into a forest in Indonesia. I can tell you a lot as an ecologist, but I can tell you almost nothing about the species that I'm looking at and what they do and how they act and what their names are and all of that. Why? Because there's no tool, there's no any mechanism by which I can know that. 
yes, there is a botanist somewhere who could stand next to me and tell me what I'm looking at, but that person is not there and will not be there and will not be there for an eight-year-old kid in a grade school, nor for a farmer, nor for a regulatory agent. So what we've done is tried first with the ACG in Costa Rica to basically ask the question, can we get a DNA barcode for identification from basically everything in this forest? For example, right now we have just caught 35,000 species of insects with nine malaise traps and three hectares of tropical rainforest. 35,000, that's a third of the species recorded for all of Europe in three hectares. Wow. We've now DNA barcoded all of them, cost $1 a person, $1 an insect, I'm sorry. Not $1 a species, $1 per insect. That from about a million insects from those traps. That's the kind of real world that the dictionary needs to be able to deal with. Yes, we can identify birds with a bird book. We can identify mammals with a mammal book. We can do fish, but you can't touch 80 to 90% of the real biodiversity in that forest. 50,000 species of fungi in the ACG. Now, the second thing is, how do you turn that into the real world? The turn is that you track very carefully, very closely, the, the, the people who are building the gadgets for the medical world to be able to do the effectively barcoding or eat a bigger piece of the genome from a gadget. Today, right now, for $3,000, you can have your own gadget and stand there in the forest. But what you don't have is the barcode library to go with it. It can do the extraction, the sequencing, and all of that. What I want to see is something that costs the cost of the plastic comb in your back pocket, in everybody's back pocket which we're now talking about 8 billion people on the same team. So that's what BioAlpha is. Now it started out labeled just for the ACG that way. Then we have a friendly government right now who's allowed it to expand and legally made it legally available, the concept for the whole country. And the government is working now with us closely to have this happen. Now, why the government? We're an NGO. By accident, way back, in 1985 and earlier, when we started thinking outside the box, we went into a national park for protection, not for conservation, for protection from some serendipitous damages to our study plots outside. And because of that joining with the government in the national park, we found that we have not only the freedom to be entrepreneurs and think outside the box, but have the solidarity of the government behind us. But this has required a whole lot of accommodation between the academic world and the political social world. So that's where the challenges have been. Not in the detailed technology of measuring and understanding the forest. That's a luxury for us now. So that's the challenge for, to me, the audience for the ATBC. Um, one, one quick other answer to your question is that BioAlpha is aimed at and designed for what in the 60s was called consciousness ra raising, but what in Dan's uh, text is social acceptance, which is the yeah. only, given that people run the world, the only view that we have of possible survival of these species is that they are widely understood and related to, and BioAlpha is intended to do that with the incredible richness that is available in Costa Rica and with public participation and complete um, open, open stacks barcode of whatever is found. And that is why the name BioAlpha is not based on English. It's based on Spanish because it's for a Spanish audience. Yeah. That's why the logo is an insect that's known by practically everybody in Latin America because of a bunch of silly things that are associated with it. Yeah. So that's why it was chosen. Not a parrot, not a pretty bird, or not a pretty butterfly. <clears throat> Thank you so much to you both. Liza, I will let you <clears throat> go on with some of the questions and then we will continue. Uh, 
Great. I will. There was a, a question that that is um, for Lissy Coley. Um, first, there was a, a comment from Roxana appreciating your quote. It's a jungle out there. Um, I, I also appreciate it when I heard that. I thought I, I might steal that for a talk in the future. Um, that's a great, great one. Um, and then we have a question from Carolina. Um, really interesting talk, Lizzie. Thank you. You show large differences among Lepidoptera families. How large are the intra-family differences in the preference of these caterpillars? Uh, actually, they're large too. And um, I greatly simplified it by lumping 9,000 uh, compounds that we found in Inga into chemistry, that they care about chemistry. But uh, in fact, um, each species um, is slightly different in terms of uh, what it can handle. And so that was a gross oversimplification. Uh, and yet there, um, I, I think it's important because it's hard to understand how trees can uh, still stay in the evolutionary arms race, given that herbivores have a much shorter generation time. And uh, I think the fact that you still see a family signature in the types of compounds or the types of defenses in general um, suggests that it may be difficult for herbivores to, um, to keep up, in fact, with uh, the trees in terms of uh, that there, you see these evolutionary constraints, this conservatism in many of the traits. So um, if we take each species separately, um, we can explain, yes, each species is, is different in terms of um, what it can handle. And yet you still see these, these sort of evolutionary constraints. And I used to say it's a jungle out there a lot during my lectures to keep myself awake when I was <laughs> talking to 200 sleeping undergraduates. <laughs> I don't believe that, <clears throat> Lizzie, but that's, that's great. We have um, questions for, um, for the three of you and with many different perspectives and, and interests and, and ideas. So let me turn uh, now um, uh, for a question to John. This is a question from Robert Bakshi. And the question is, given that the two types of ecosystem you describe can often occur relatively close geographically, what do you think moderates that transition or that transition? John, please. All right, uh, I'm happy to answer that one uh, because uh, uh, with uh, my colleague, Terry Henkel, we've studied that a bit, these uh, the monodominant forests in the, in the tropics, uh, whether in South America or in Africa, are surrounded by mixed forests with uh, hundreds of species in them. And uh, uh, the boundary between the monodominant and the mixed forest is very, very sharp, very clear. And we showed that they don't correspond to real edaphic boundaries. So there's, there's a very open question about uh, the whether these monodominant patches are, are very long age or they're very uh, uh, last only a few hundred years, we don't know that. But the, the competition rules in the in the monodominant, as I've described them, as as Latka Volterra communities, and uh, they uh, they have these properties. I mentioned that they they uh, they there there is no uh, pest pressure on the on the. Uh, uh, the, the seedlings and saplings, there, there is a very full age, age structure and uh, um, they are extremely shade tolerant. So they, can, they just simply shade out everything else. Uh, whereas that, that complete age structure all in the same, same small area is something you absolutely never find in any species in a Jansen Connell forest. That's, it's like night and day, they're, they're really opposites. Mm -hmm. Great. Liza? Um, so I have a, another question from Robbie Bagchi, not surprisingly, um, which is um, about the enemies of herbivores. And this is for any and all presenters. And um, it's to what extent might enemies such as parasitoids of herbivores influence Jansen-Connell dynamics? Is it possible that density dependent regulation of insect populations might influence regulation of the plant community. And how do you think this would, would play out? Then anyone can just jump in. I would, I would leave that to Lissy. She knows more about this. Or Dan, Dan knows about it too. I'm not a 
insect guy. <laughs> uh, Lizzie, you're muted. Lizzie, you are muted. You are muted. I, I'm muted. That's probably better that way. I was going to leave it to John. <laughs> your work, your work with the top predators disappearing, and then the the explosion of herbivores and devastation of plants. Um, and uh, I think that's a great um, question, and I don't have a good answer. Um, I, I do think that um, that a lot of like leaf young leaf production um, is often um, very sporadic, presumably to escape um, you know to satiate herbivores, and so you get synchronous um, production, and you also get it frequently um, at the beginning of the rainy season before the insect populations have exploded. Um, and this is total speculation, but on, um, on, in El Nino years, uh, you often get longer dry seasons and el all the insects are knocked back, uh, including the, I presume the predatory insects. And so then um, the few times I've seen it, there'll be an explosion of the herbivore population following a, a long pr a pronounced dry season. And my hypothesis, um, but I don't have any observations on it, is that um, that perhaps the, the parasitoids and predators have been uh, knocked back also and set, such that there's this window of escape for the herbivores. Uh, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. Then we, <clears throat> anybody else in the panel would like to? Um... Well, I will mention one thing. When we've studied the uh, Herbivory on very young seedlings at, at Cashew. We've we've got ourselves involved. Uh, this is through my collaborator Patricia Alvarez, in in a group groups of insects that are very poorly known. Uh, the, the the when uh, 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 seedlings appear from un, undispersed seeds underneath a parent tree, uh, they uh, they can live there for up to four or five years, but eventually they all die. One hundred percent die. And we found it very difficult to find the, the causes of death. You have to be there at the right time and then you pull a plant up and put it in a plastic bag and wait for something to come out. And uh, we've, we found uh, with great effort, uh, a tiny little stem borers that would go down the, the uh, central axis of the, of the seedling and, and kill it by destroying the vascular system. We also root borers. They were even harder to to uh, come about, they turn out to be completely unknown species of insects. So uh, I think there's a huge amount there to be learned. We really, we're really just scratching the, the surface as to what and what causes the, the almost total elimination of, of seedlings underneath parent trees in, in Jansen Connell Forest. So let me add one thing to this um, discussion. First thing to add is that um, there's a lot of focus in what we're hearing and what other people have thought about um, specialist uh, herbivores of one kind or another. We have to remember there's another kind of facultative specialist. It's called a big seed crop falls somewhere and the peccaries, for example, learn mm -hmm. about it and they decide to go to it and literally vacuum clean up all those seeds. But then, then a week later, they're not eating those seeds at all. So they're very generalist. But at the time, they can become facultative specialists on the spot. Those are different from what we're talking about now, but they need to be added into the, the, the way of thinking about that kind of process. The second thing is for the parasites of the herbivores that are feeding on these plants, um, we've just spent the last 30 years looking hard at them. Uh, and, and out of that, in a general sort of way, I can say that as the as the herbivores get depressed under various seasonal or annual circumstances like Lissy has just mentioned, um, the parasites really take it in the neck. They then it goes way down. And then they, of course, recover when the circumstances get better if the prey gets better. And that's the big if, because um, if the prey doesn't get better, like bring in all the rain you want, uh, that doesn't help the specialist parasite. And um, so that's part of the dynamic that's absolutely going on in, in this, this forest. Whether it can influence a particular tree in a particular circumstance, of course it can. Um, but on the other hand, you have to remember that if we sum over our parasite loads for all these herbivores, um, which are almost all caterpillars, um, but we're talking about tens of thousands of them now, 
uh, we sum over that, the parasites are only taking somewhere on the order to one to 10% of those caterpillars. The rest of them are being taken by fungi, for scorpions, by insect eating vertebrates, birds of one kind or another, diseases of one kind or another. There's a lot of mortality, but it is only a, the parasites are only a small fraction of that mortality. So I'll just add that into the, the overall formula of thinking <clears throat> about this. Okay. <clears throat> Rodolfo, if yeah. I could add just one thing. Please, please go there, ahead. There is an overlay going on in the present that while we are spending time in Santa Rosa, what is clear in the great insect decline, which is yeah. if horrible, is that a lot of the insect insect predators are also going down. And for example, acylids yeah. in the early ra rainy season used to, robber flies used to be everywhere. They would catch all kinds of insects. Yeah. Um, right now we're seeing amongst the herbivorous insects, the larger ones are really going down and very rare. Um, this year, there were some sphingids, but hardly any Saturnids. Mm -hmm. But um, we are not seeing nearly as many insect predators mm -hmm. either mm -hmm. of the intermediate size insects. And it's as if the whole insect community now is shifting to little tiny things, mm -hmm. which the medium size insect, insect predators cannot feed on either. Yeah. Yeah. So there's something major happening at this present moment that is entirely apart from any of the models and explanations, but the world is changing. Yeah. Well, what we see is climate change. I mean, that, that clearly is the one overlay that's occurring everywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, we have to really think about the drivers of, of, of global change, not as independent uh, drivers, but they're operating in nasty, complex synergies, climate, land use change, and so on and so forth, deformation. And, and Dan and, and William, I'm so glad that you brought these additional layers to the complexity of this thing. And Dan, thank you for mentioning the case of the peccaries because that is also related to this other big issue that deformation, the, the loss or changes in the relative abundance of different big animals that are not necessarily um, specialists. I would like to, to take another question that is addressed to the three of you. Actually, it's a challenging question um, posed by my friend Nacho Villar. Saludos, Nacho. The question is um, the following is, uh, as I said, for the three of you in any order you might want to chime in. This is the question, a similar recruiting curve to the one predicted by the JC hypothesis could be obtained by other alternative or complementary processes. For example, conspecific competition between seedlings and saplings and adults combined with seed dispersal away from parent trees by biotic dispersal vectors, such as frugivory, could result in a similar curve. Another mechanism that could, that could generate a similar curve would be a generalist consumer and not specialized enemies with the same model, functional response, spatially switching prey as predicted from optimal foraging theory. I wonder whether such mechanisms might also contribute to the recruitment curve. They, all, they have not received so much attention as the impact of specialized enemies. Hence, their influence on diversity are still is still quite cryptic. So it's related to some of the things you guys have been saying, and I would like to see what some of you, who wants to start in addressing this question, which was posed to the three of you. Well, I, let me start off. I think I uh, can uh, 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 reply to that if I understood the question fully. It, uh, we have. We have worked on what uh, we call seedling carpets. They're uh, um, flushes of the seedlings in the cotyledon stage, mainly uh, resulting from the germination of, of undispersed seeds. And so these occur underneath the crowns of, of reproducing trees. And yeah. we've, we've monitored uh, for up to for four years, this has worked with Patricia Alvarez, um, the the dynamics and the causes of death of the seedlings that were conspecific with the tree overhead and what we call heterospecifics, all the other species that happen to have seedlings growing in that, in that area. And we followed them over four years. Well, uh, uh, to make a long story very short, overwhelmingly the conspecific seedlings were killed by highly specialized 
uh, mostly arthropods and fungi um, that didn't infect any of the other species that were there or even conspecifics of the tree in question. Whereas the heterospecific seedlings growing in the same places intermixed with the conspecific uh, died from a multiplicity of causes, um, in, in the, uh, herbivory and, and uh, the tromping and, and drying out in the dry season and all sorts of things, um, but not at all from the, the, the causes that were killing the conspecifics growing right next to them. So there's like night and day, a complete separation of the mortality spectrum affecting seedlings growing side by side. That's pretty convincing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Let me add one bit to that. Um, we, we've in contact with an awful lot of basically farmers or farmers offspring. Um, and um, they come to us and we've seen it very strongly is that if you are trying to grow a plantation of a particular tree species, um, the worst place to get the soil for that is from underneath an old adult of the same species. Because if you do that, you got that soil, you put it in potted plants and all that sort of stuff, they grow up for a month or two months or a year and a half and they all die. And they're dying of a fungus that is now maintained as a major component of the soil underneath that reproductive tree because it gets refed every year or every time the tree reproduces. And so the outcome is that if you want surviving kidneys, you go 100 meters, 200 meters away to get your soil or more that you're going to put for your potted seedlings. This is the other thing I'd like to comment on Lizzie's comment about distance. You have to remember that from an insect, 100 meters may be nothing. To you, it's 100 meters. It's, it's a long distance in the forest. But for a lot of flying insects who use chemistry of the air to, go, to know where their hosts are, Kilometers may be close, as opposed to a peccary who needs to know about it within the near 100 meters or 500 meters. Yeah. So th there's a distance component in all of this that is independent from our usual human measurements. Mm -hmm. It's got to see from sort of through the eyes and the, and, the, and the dispersal movement abilities of the animal who's doing the damage rather than our viewpoint. Great, excellent. Lizzie, you want to say something on that topic, or shall we move on to another? Let's move on. Okay, uh, Liza, why don't you take the next question of your choosing, please? We have lots of questions still, unfortunately, and not much time, but uh, let's continue. Uh, great, I'll, I'll ask another question. I've been, I've been told we've been given the go-ahead to keep going for, for a while longer, even though some of the audience may be moving to other sessions, we, we have the room um, and we have plenty of questions. Um, so I'll go with the next question, which is for another question for Lissy about uh, evolution of Inga defenses and that these defenses are evolutionary labile, both occurring locally and regionally. Do you think the pattern would hold if we look at this question, but at the plant community level? Um, so beyond Inga to unrelated plant groups. And, I, and it, do you think at this level, phylogeny would become important for structuring herbivore assemblages and plant communities? And so I think it's really a question about at, at, what, at what scale in terms of uh, phylogenetic relatedness, do we see a signal at, at higher scales um, beyond yeah. the, the genus? No, that's a great question. Um, and of course, um, Ehrlich and Raven showed that there were, there was a phylogenetic signal. And I think it's because they were looking at the level of families. And so for instance, like mustards make mustard oils and that was a marvelous evolutionary invention, but it doesn't happen very often. But you'll see that signature maybe at the family level. In, um, whereas uh, many other uh, work um, on Piper and Bursera and Proteum, and I'm forgetting something else at the moment, uh, are also showing that if you look within a, um, more closely related things within a genus, uh, you, you tend to find no phylogenetic signal for defenses. Um, and uh, you know, and I, I think in my pet hypothesis is that, um, that mo and in, in those um, genera I just mentioned, they find the same thing, that it's, uh, nobody's making anything really novel. They're not coming up with a new silver bullet. And in Inga, what we find is that um, probably all Inga have the, the genes to make 
all the, the compounds, but they're just expressed in different combinations in each species. And so um, closely related species then um, are just, can switch from saponins to phenolics, which from an herbivore perspective is a huge evolutionary challenge. And so um, I think what we see often at the tips of the branches of the phylogenetic branches is that um, they're mixing and max mixing and matching um, compounds that they already can make in different combinations. Um, what, listening to, to Lissy, uh, it does occur to me to mention another major complicating factor here. The ACG, where we're doing our total caterpillar inventory, stretches from dry forest ecosystems to cloud forest to rainforest. Over that entire uh, spectrum, we have insect species who occur everywhere. So in our dry forest, for example, to pick one, we have a, a butterfly, big butterfly that you've seen as adults called Archipropona gulina. In our dry forest, it only eats one species of Lauraceae. Why? Because there is only one species of Lauraceae in our dry forest. When it goes over to the rainforest, five kilometers away, it eats 23 species of Ocatea and other Lauraceae. So if you are in your place-based plot where you're doing your studies, you come and say, this is a specialist on Ocatea varigonsis. But if you're over there in the rainforest side, you say, wow, it's a generalist across all of Lauraceae. <laughs> then you notice that there's another 23 species of Lauraceae in the same place that it does not eat. So is that a specialist or generalist? <laughs> yeah. That's a cool perspective, uh, Dan. Um, because I'm terrified that we might run out of time, I want to make sure that uh, this question that is addressed to all three of you uh, is actually presented. And so the question is actually uh, posed by Camila Pisano, and it says as follows. Many thanks for the three great and very inspiring talks. You all have been working in the tropics for many years. And as Dr. Jansen said, you all have seen the destruction of many tropical forests where you have worked. What would be your advice for a mid-career professor in the tropics with limited funds and time for research to focus research and teaching that would motivate students to make a difference in the real world? For the three of you. <laughs> okay, let me, since we've been trying to do that for the last 25 years, let's, let's try it. Um, I would say that any country in the tropics where one is positioned to do this will be different. So the verbs will be different, the verbs will be the same, but the nouns will be different. So you don't look for a general formula you can follow in Guatemala, Angola, and some piece of Indonesia. The formula is only by the verbs. The second thing is join other powerful systems. The academic world has trained you and trains us all to work as independent lone wolves with the resources we as lone wolves can harvest and get under our control. That doesn't do it. What we found in the last 20 years is the pain of joining forces with the commercial world, with the economic world, with the social world, with the government world, with the other NGO world, gives you the resources you need to express your ideas. This also though requires that, it was, as I said quickly, perhaps too quickly, is that you have to look at what you want to do as your research and ask what in the surrounding world, the outside world can make use of, or perhaps could be making use of, your information, your desires, your drive for learning things and add it to their successes. So suddenly they become champions for you as much as yourself being a champion for yourself. In other words, in 2011, NSF cut off my head explicitly because I don't use US graduate students and undergraduates to do my research. They're all Costa Ricans, all farm kids all people with very small education levels. So we put our energy into bringing them up to the level of a US graduate student. And that was not fitting well with the Trump administration, not at all. Hmm. 
So that's the price you pay for doing this, but it's a different kind of thing. So instead of saying, I have just spent about a total of a week working on a proposal between Jap Japan and Costa Rica, it should be about $2 million. If I go to NSF and try to get $2 million from NSF to do my research, it would take me a lot longer and a lot more administrative pain. But if these people can find that it works for them, they then become part of getting us the budget to do what we want to do. Um, just a quickie add on thinking, trying to put myself in the shoes of this person. The first critical thing that a professor can do is change the standards that he requires of his students so that they're not strictly academic. Um, the strictly academic um, requirements these days are not suited towards encouraging students yeah. to, to be aware and work in conservation. Second thing is that there are movements, student movements, people talking about this. So um, if I were in this professor's place, I would form a little committee of the most um, internet happy students to go out and try to find in Europe particularly or anywhere where there are young spark plugs who are doing this in their own areas because this has to come, the, the most hope that we've seen are little pieces of light all over the place, particularly in, in Europe. And um, you want to feed into that energy, get ideas to share with what is still unfortunately outliers in the academic community. Thank you so much. I just want to thank Camilla, I think it was for, for that question, because I think that's the most difficult and the most important question for all of us. And I always try, try and tell my students, just do something. But as a professor, you're in a position to help seed those ideas. And, you know, Winnie and Dan have done amazing things in Costa Rica. Tom and I, at a lower scale, got um, a bioprospecting program going in Panama. And um, well, frankly, I couldn't have cared less about human health. And I certainly knew nothing about drug discovery. Um, and so it was a very steep learning curve and lots of rejections. But now it's, it's going on its own. We've got $15 million from NSF and NIH. And, and now it's self-sustaining. Um, some of the early people that worked on it are now PIs. There's a, a drug discovery, you know, sustainable run by Panamanians. Um, and, uh, and it's also brought an urban voice to conservation. So people that are bioprospectors, they actually have access to power. And before they couldn't have cared less about fa uh, forests and now they understand how critical they are. And uh, so they actually have made a huge conservation um, difference, you know, Panamanian voices in Panama. So it, it was well beyond our wildest dreams and you just have to start somewhere and you never know where it's gonna end up. And it was based on baby leaves, the defenses in baby leaves. That's where we looked for chemicals. Yeah. Something my mother always thought was completely useless. You know, who cares <laughs> that caterpillar is eating baby leaves. <laughs> Thank you, Lizzie. John? It, it could, could I put in my two bits worth on this? I, I, I would take a little issue with Dan's argument that one size doesn't fit all. I think it possibly can because I've had uh, similar experiences working in Peru and working in Venezuela and more recently in, in Malaysia, where we've worked very closely with, with students from each of those countries. Yes, I've had my own graduate students, but it's always been my policy that they do their thing and I do my thing. And uh, when we come together, that's fine, but it's not, it's not necessary that it happened that way. And then I'd work with Peruvians as my closest collaborators for 20 or 30 years. And you'll see in my publications, they're always Peruvians listed on those publications as, as co-authors. And so I think what's required is, is uh, if you're a faculty member, go do your thing, do what you're good at, do what you love, do what most excites you, but bring people along with it and provide opportunity and inspiration. I would say those two words are the most critical, opportunity and inspiration. And then once you've provided that, they'll, they'll go from there. And uh, these, we've, we've had over, over two or 300 people in 
in uh, come to Peruvians come to Cashew, and I haven't been able to follow their trajectories, but an incredible large fraction of them have either gone into academics or professional conservation work. There are dozens and dozens of them that are and now they work for NGOs and uh, it, the experience changed their lives. So I think, I think that is a message that, that is, uh, is replicable in other places. What John has just said is what I meant by the verbs. Yeah. Those are all action mm -hmm. activities. Those are the actions. The nouns are yeah. different. Whether you're in Guatemala or dry forest or rainforest or Antarctica, it doesn't matter that so much. But it's the verbs that matter. Thank you so much to the three of you for those wonderful uh, uh, comments. Liza, you, you will take the last question. I, I think that we are close to being out of time. And the last question was actually something um, that I think you all just answered, which was um, what would be some key advice that you'd give early career researchers? And I think that um, I think everyone's probably pretty inspired and energized right now. And it would be a, a good time to, to sum up and let people head to other sessions. So Rodolfo, do you want to uh, summarize some, some take homes? The, um, not really, because that will take me about 300 uh, minutes. But I, what I want to say <laughs> is thank you so very much to the three amazing mega panelists of this morning. This panel has been so inspirational, so rich, and so um, fantastic for uh, you know, the young people which are, uh, you know, a, a real hope and, and um, expectation that we can leave something better for them and they can help us to do something better for the rest of the homo sapiens and for the rest of the, of the planet going forward, given these very challenging situations we're facing today on the planet with biodiversity laws and so on and so forth. So thank you all very, very much. Thank you, Liza, for um, being with me in this uh, panel. And thank you, people, all the attendants this morning for their uh, interest and participation. Thank you so very much, everybody. Have a wonderful day. Mm. Okay. Okay.